You know, there's something bigger than the border between Canada and the United States. Something that binds our lands together better than any international boundary ever could. I'm on a journey to explore that essential element, Aboriginal people. And so I'm using the border as a guide to meet as many fascinating people in as many interesting places as I can. This is about our history, our culture, and our future. Because for me, the border is not a boundary. It's something completely different. And I call it the medicine line. There are things that go completely unexplained with Aboriginal culture. Some of them are ancient, others just discovered. Either can be a new frontier, like an insight into who we really are. I usually just accept these mysteries as what they are. They're mysteries, that's it, period. But I just had to check out something that was completely unexplained. Totally crazy, truth be told, and I had to see it for myself. It can really only be described as out of this world. I'm just outside of Walsh, Alberta, the location of this mystery. And this thing can only be seen from space. Or so I'm told. And it wasn't discovered until 2006 by a person just cruising over Google Earth. It became an internet sensation soon after. And as you can see, from this perspective, it kind of looks like an Aboriginal warrior listening to a iPod? Some call it the Badlands Guardian, and truthfully, no one has a clue why or how it ever got here. Is it a natural fluke, or is it man-made? That's where I'm headed, to take a look around for myself. You know, there's no road signs or anything in these parts, so I kind of hope I get the right spot. I wanted to see if I could capture the Badlands Guardian on camera. But first, I'd have to get permission from the landowner. And this must be him. I think this is the place. We've been here 63 years, and I came here when I was seven years old. So I've spent pretty well my entire life in this area. What's the feeling when you're out here alone? It's a nice feeling. It's, it's quiet here. Peace with the, with the world. Any idea on the history of this land before you took it over? Natives. They migrated through here probably a hundred years ago. Our ancestors told us that this was a, sort of their, their uh, right of way or, or their path they took from one reservation to the other. They traveled through this country here and they left some marks where they traveled, stone rings, that's on this range here. When you actually saw the picture taken from the air, you immediately knew what it was. Tell me about it. If you've ever seen this picture, you can say, well, there's definitely some similarities to them. It, it does look very real to me, almost perfect. We're in a ravine, and uh, you can't tell from right here what the tops look like. You have to get up in the air. You have to get up higher up and uh, look at all the hills from the top down. Any theories on how that could have happened? I haven't got an idea how it all, all began, but that's as much as I know of it. As I've walked around, I can't quite see exactly the full view. I got a couple crazy ideas of putting cameras in the air. Is that okay if I try this? Absolutely. Since Norman knew the landscape so well, him and his horse, Rusty, pointed me in the direction of a good place to start. With permission from Norman, I decided to take a look around. But how in the heck was I gonna film something this big? This is huge. Norman was right. The landscape has rocks and stone circles everywhere. I think this large chunk of land is really well-traveled. I'm gonna have to get creative if I'm gonna capture any kind of image of this site. If you were looking at me from outer space, you would see that right now, I am in the ear of the Badlands Guardian. Now the face is over there, and that's where we want to shoot from. But I could have nine cameras, and from ground level, it's not going to give us anything. Somehow, we got to get a camera up 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 feet, and give you a shot down to see what we need to see. I got a few ideas. Let's give it a whirl. First up, I'm going to take this mini helicopter 
for a little test drive. It works. Now I just have to attach the camera. Okay, that didn't work. Ouch. I guess this is why I'm not a helicopter pilot. This helicopter is controlled directly off my iPad, but in actuality, moving it around is a lot harder than it looks. I finally got it up there, but it wasn't high enough. I had to come up with a better plan. Something that could get me high above the Guardian's face. And I think I have just the thing to do it with. I'm just outside Walsh, Alberta and I'm trying to capture an image of something that's larger than life. It's called the Badlands Guardian, and it's so massive that you've got to get high above it to actually see what it looks like. With all my years' experience as a cameraman, I know this is going to be a tough image to capture, but I gotta give it a try. Before I left on this road trip, I went online and bought some surplus U.S. Army issue weather balloons. I'm not sure if I'm really allowed to do that. Oh well, that's where we're at. These things can go hundreds of feet in the air in just seconds. I had to figure out how to attach a camera to one and then how to control it after takeoff. High enough. Okay, let's try this again. These things are slippery. Okay, one more try. As a one-man show, out here in the middle of nowhere, wow, this seems a lot harder than it probably looks. But I finally got one up for a little look around. I wasn't very successful at capturing pictures of the Guardian, but short of building my own satellite and launching it into space by myself, I think I did pretty good. And I just may have captured a small picture of the Guardian's nose in these frames. It's hard to tell. But this Guardian site, this is an interesting thing to come across. If this was made by man into the landscape, it would have taken forever to do it. And if this is natural, well, that's one hell of a fluke. But there's something else that's really laid back in this land. I mean on the ground level, not just from above. It's really peaceful here. I can look around me for 360 degrees and not see another living soul. And if you ask me, it's kind of cool that something this big could be hidden for such a long time. You know, I bet there's locals here that have no idea that their whole lives they've been traveling over a giant face in the landscape. I mean, it's been here the whole time. I wanted to stick around and find more ways to film this guardian. But there was another story, and that one was pulling me south. I'm headed to Lewiston, Idaho to meet someone who knows what the view from outer space really looks like. 
And it just so happens that the local Nez Pierce tribe says Lewiston is home to its own human figure in the landscape. And maybe it's this bad boy right here. From a few angles, it kind of looks like a giant of some sort just laying down. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here to meet with John Harrington, the first Native American in outer space. I've never met a real life astronaut before. John, how are you? I wanted to see what he's been up to since touching back down on Earth. How did you become an astronaut? When I was about eight years old, I used to sit in a cardboard box and dream I was going to the moon. But I never thought it was something that I'd, I'd actually accomplish until much later in my career, I was a naval aviator, I was a test pilot, and I realized during test pilot school that the people that I admired as a kid growing up, you know, half of them had been naval aviators. So I was doing the exact same thing in my career that those guys had done in their career. Did you always know this is what you wanted to do? Well, I mean, I, I dreamed about it, but I never really thought it was something that was I could actually accomplish because I didn't know anybody. What are the odds when somebody wants to actually fulfill that dream of going into space? One of the astronauts gets up and he writes on the board, um, one comma zero 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 comma zero 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 comma zero 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 comma zero zero one, and then he writes three hundred. And he said, you know, in the history of the human race, only 300 people or so have gone into space. You're going to be one of these maybe 400 people that get to go. So never forget how fortunate you are. Another building block for the foundation of the International Space Station. When I got to NASA, within a few weeks I was there, one of the folks came to me and said, hey, did you know that you're the first Native American astronaut? I had no clue. You know, I've always been proud of my heritage, and I'm a member of a federally recognized tribe. And to be in a position where I can show kids that you can do this, this is what you want to do, then uh, I'm fortunate to be in that role. And it's an honor and a huge responsibility, and, and take great pride in that. Tell me a little more about that role models. How do, how do when you meet Native Americans, young Native Americans, what kind of response do you get? <laughs> you know, I've had people come to me and say, I identify with you, and I identify that you had a hard time in school, and now you're doing this. People said, I, I realize I can do that as well. That's when you realize you're in a position where people can look to you and say, if that guy can do it, why can't I? I'm no different than anybody else. You know, it's, you work hard, and you hopefully you go down a path that leads you in, into that position. And, and people tell you that, you know, you made a difference in my life, and I've gone back to school, and I'm doing better in school now because of what you said or what you do. It makes you feel really, really good. It makes you, it just fills your heart, and you go, wow, this is, I never imagined I'd be in that position. Tell me about the training. My primary job was to sit on the flight deck uh, with the, the commander one side, pilot here, and I sat right in the middle. And my job was a flight engineer, so I was part of the flight crew, monitoring the systems, paying attention to things, malfunctions, we'd do checklists. But my mission once I got into orbit was to do spacewalks. And so my training consisted of being in the simulator to prepare as a mission specialist, an ascent and entry, and then I also trained in the pool to uh, to be a spacewalker and actually, you know, do an assembly mission on the space station. So, what's it like to walk in space? The first time I came out of the airlock uh, to walk in space, it was about 220 miles straight down to the Earth, and I came out and I held on really tight, you know, for the first few minutes. But the harder you hang on, the more tired you get. So you have to really learn to hang on with just the tips of your fingers and not not stress it. But I had to crawl around uh, the outside of the airlock and go up to the top of this uh, structure to get a tool. And that was my practice. That's my translation adaptation. Get used to being in space. And I remember this is not bad, you know, and you're you're cruising around the outside and I get up to this this toolbox and it's like climbing a cliff. Because I'm reaching up and I'm climbing out of this overhang and I go to get this tool, and when I grab the toolbox, the toolbox goes and it shakes and my heart goes because I thought the toolbox was going to come off of my hands and I was going to do one of these things and, and that was would not be good. After my, I calmed down a little bit, uh, I put the tool on my, on my work site and, and climbed back down and started uh, doing my job. But to be in an environment where your body does not tell you which way is up, it's what your eyes tell you because your body doesn't sense gravity and so you can look at something and if you're not looking at everything you can automatically flip upside down mentally. So you can be upside down underneath the space station like this and then all of a sudden your mind tells you you're looking down, not looking up. That was the most remarkable part about spacewalking. It's what you see, not what you feel. What if we just pass over the Caribbean? Oh my goodness. What's the view from there like? Uh, I remember looking down at places that I had grown up. You see the macro view. You don't see the things you know you're really familiar with. It was neat to watch that picture move underneath you. When you're up there, your day would be regimented? 
Normal day is about 16 hours. Uh, you're, you don't go by the sunrise or the sunset because it happens every 45 minutes. Every 45 minutes, the sun changes? Yeah, the sun will come up, you get about a five minute warning. The sun's coming up in five minutes, and so you put your visor down, and then the uh, sun goes psh. You know, beautiful colors, just gorgeous, and all of a sudden it's brilliant, brilliant uh, light. And then you get a five minute warning to sunset, and you turn your headlights on, and then the sun goes down, and it's dark. Does it screw you to be having it happen every hour? Um, you get used to it. I mean, to go to sleep, though, you put a mask over your eyes. It takes 90 minutes to go around the Earth. So for 45 of those minutes, the sun's up. And for the next 45 minutes, the sun's down. And so you do about 16 orbits of the Earth every 24 hours. That's a view you don't see every day. That's the busiest I've ever been in my life. Every day you had something to do and you had to get it done. What do you do with your downtime? When I could look out the window for pleasure was not until the very last part of the mission because we were supposed to come home and the weather was bad in Florida, so they waved us off. In the next landing, we couldn't land either, and I could look back across Florida, across the Gulf of Mexico, to Louisiana and Mississippi, and I could see storms, just clouds, all the way back across that huge area, and I realized we were coming home for at least a couple days. So I had a chance to look out the window for pleasure because of a delay coming home. John couldn't get me into space, but offered the next best thing to take me flying. But first, we had to pull out the plane and inspect it. Flying with an astronaut, well, that's kind of cool. in Idaho, and I'm about to go flying with astronaut John Harrington, who was the first Native American in outer space. Not only did he go up in the shuttle, but he spent time on the International Space Station and actually did a spacewalk. What I do is I always start on the left side of the plane. Well, I start looking at all the, the ailerons, the flaps, make sure the pins are in place so things don't fall out. When I joined the Navy, they had a video of a guy pre-flighting a jet and he found a little teeny screw loose on this huge plane. I thought, how does he do that? Just, you pay attention to the details. This light has to come on until you're gonna stall because you normally wouldn't feel it. I always check and make sure nobody's been building nests on the inside. I mean, no cats have been climbing on your airplane and having kittens. And I'll show you the, uh, how the rudder pedals work and, and all the instruments as we go. Awesome. Okay? Okay. Cool. This plane was pretty small. But with John's help, I found a way to put a bunch of mini cameras all over the place before we took off. I wanted to capture the landscape from above. I just want to take it all in. I've had a lot of people tell me that they've heard stories that the Eagle has been to the moon before. There's a lot of legends that people take very seriously and they share that with me and I honor those legends and I take it very seriously because it's very, um, you know, these are stories that have been passed down for generations and they're very important to people. And so to be able to, to be on one side and the technical side and be able to be in space, but also to appreciate and honor these stories you hear from elders, it's a good feeling. It really just makes you feel good. Were you raised uh, culturally? Have you taken part in a ceremony as a youngster? Never practiced traditional ceremonies or anything. It really wasn't until, until I came to NASA and I got back involved and started meeting people and I started going, you know, you're just like my uncle, you know? I, you, could be, you know you could be my aunt. I started meeting people across the country going, there's a, there's a similarity to the people that I've grown up and I've been around my entire life that are just like somebody that I met in Alaska or just like somebody I met in New Mexico or Arizona. And, you realize it's a huge, fa to me, it's a huge family. How has walking in space, how has space travel changed you? You appreciate really the incredible beauty that is the Earth. You have to appreciate the fact there's, I, I believe, a creator that has you know, made all of this possible. But to see it from that perspective, you know it's there, you know your family's there, but to be down on it is where you really appreciate really what, what the beauty is. So it changed my perspective on my place in the world, your mind significance in the great scheme of things, but made me appreciate what a remarkable planet we have.
John Harrington's perspective on life really is fascinating. He's lived in space and watched the entire Earth pass by. He watched the sun rise and set 16 times in a single day. And as the first Native American astronaut in space, it was an honor just to talk to him. Can you teach me something in the Chicksaw language? The tribe actually has an app on the iPad and the iPhone called Anumpa, Chikasha Shanumpali, would be like the Chickasaw language. You bring it up and it's got greetings and phrases and, and counting and things like that, and you can just touch a button and, and learn it. So, well, like Chukma, Chukma would be a hello, or Helito would be more of a more informal hello. Uh, Chukma would be a cabla. I was told that was once was good afternoon. Chukma? Yeah, it's like, you know, hi. Helito. Uh, hi. Hello, yeah, hey. You never say goodbye. You know, it's more of a say, I'll see you later. Yeah, that's kind of I found that a lot on a lot of my travel routes, that there's yeah. no goodbye in a lot of First Nation languages. I leave Lewiston feeling I know a bit more about this world we live in, much more than when I arrived. Going up in the plane as well as sending up my own weather balloon with a camera attached has given me a different perspective. The Earth is actually a fairly small place, so it's important that we share it in the best ways we know how. But now for me, I'm back on the road, off to meet more interesting people, and they're gonna have stories that I'm sure are gonna blow me away.